everyone. My name is Danielle Solish. And my name is Iman Chaudhry, and you're listening to the sixth episode of Seeing Clearly, a pre-clerkship guide to all things ophthalmology. On today's episode, we will be interviewing Dr. Braga Melli. So I'm just going to begin by giving a quick little introduction about Dr. Braga Mealy. So Dr. Rosa Braga Mealy is a professor of ophthalmology in the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Toronto. She graduated magna cum laude from the University of Ottawa Medical School and then completed her residency at the University of Toronto. She then went on to complete her master's degree in higher education. Dr. Braga Mealy is a cataract specialist and a doctor and educator who speaks frequently at the both of the international and national level on advanced surgical techniques and innovations in the area of um, phaco emulsification surgery and complicated cataract cases, as well as IOL development. She is currently a cataract section editor for the iWorld and is on the editorial board of other ophthalmology publications. She was the inaugural Research Director at the Kensington Eye Institute in Toronto from 2007 to 2012, and then was appointed the Cataract Director from 2013 to 2019. She has also won multiple teaching awards, both at the undergraduate and resident levels at the University of Toronto for her teaching and mentorship abilities, including the Silver Needle Award in 2003, 2007, 2012, 2016, and 2017 for Best Resident Surgical Teacher and the University of Toronto Faculty of Medicine Community-Based Teaching Award in 2016. She was recently awarded the University of Ottawa Alumni Association 2019 Meritaz Tabaret Award, given to those that have distinguished themselves through excellence and achievement in their professional field throughout their career, have demonstrated leadership in their profession, have made a positive contribution to the prestige, influence, and reputation of the University of Ottawa, and have exercised and continued to exercise a strong positive influence in the community. So with all of that, we would like to welcome Dr. Rosa Bragamili. Thank you, that's great. We are so excited to have her here today on our podcast and I'm sure all of our listeners are extremely excited as well. So with that, we're going to get into our first question, which is what drew you to the field of ophthalmology? So to be perfectly honest, um, when I was in medical school, I was, you know, I think you go down a path in med school, am I going to be an internist? Am I a surgeon? And I think that's the first step to take. Am I um, a surgical type of personality? And I knew going into medicine that I was going to be a surgeon. I just knew I'd like to work with my hands and then I wanted to cut. And in fact, I was on the path to be a neurosurgeon. So I had done many electives in thoracic and urology and so the big surgeries and neurosurgery and had done a great elective in Toronto with the neurosurgery team at SickKids and um, was all ready to apply. They had actually even said, if you apply, you'll be accepted. And then I kind of fell in my clerkship in Ottawa. One of the surgical specialties was full with too many clerks. And they said, you know, Rosa, will you do ophthalmology for two weeks? And I said, eh, you know what, sure, it'll be like a vacation, right? That's what I thought at the time, having done so many surgical, you know, on-call specialties and stuff like that. So I went in and I did an elective with David Jordan and Brian Leonard, um, who I ended up working with. Phenomenal guys, um, great teachers, wonderful surgeons. And I started a research project with David Jordan and I fell in love with ophthalmology. And I thought this offers me everything I'm looking for, which was the ability to still interact with patients that I knew I would miss in neurosurgery, but also the ability to do innovative microsurgery, which is the part I loved about neurosurgery. And so it offered me the best of both worlds, which seems like a textbook answer, but it truly was what I saw. And then I also saw that the lifestyle was what you wanted to cater it to yourself. Mm -hmm. So you could be a retina surgeon and be as busy as any other major surgeon, or you could steer towards more medical ophthalmology if you felt you didn't wanna do that. So it offered you an opportunity to mold your career and mold your life throughout your residency and gave me more time to think about what I really wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Wow, I mean, thank you for uh, providing that insight and it's, it's, I mean, it's crazy to see where you are now and to know that it kind of was just a fluke that you ended up in ophthalmology on that elective. 
but it's it's awesome to see that you didn't know that you wanted to go into it and that yes. um you know now here you are such a successful surgeon in ophthalmology um it shows everyone especially our student listeners that keep your mind open especially during clerkship and you never know what you'll enjoy or what you won't enjoy um, might surprise you like it did with you yeah. um but kind of shifting gears a bit um, we know that your family and your interests outside of medicine are also very important aspects of your life um, and are extremely important to you. So do you mind talking a bit about those interests and how you find the time to pursue your interests outside of medicine? Um, for our listeners that don't know, uh, Dr. Bragnelli is, uh, is quite busy outside of the field of medicine. She's uh, a basketball coach, a nationally ranked female physique bodybuilder, and a second degree black belt in karate. So do you mind providing our listeners with some insight on how you managed to do it all? Well, I think what's key in this is balance. And I think what we forget is we get so caught up in our careers, and especially I'd have to say as women. So as much respect as I have for the men in my career, and many men have been mentors for me, and generally the men that have been mentors have been those with balanced lifestyles, um, that it has been... Um, tough being a woman in medicine and generally tough being a woman in ophthalmology when I first entered this career. Um, my medical school had 50% women in, God, a long time ago that I went to med school. I went in in 1989 and we had 50% women, which was really just turning around that medicine was becoming more women than men in, in many ways. But many were not going into surgical subspecialties and many were not going into ophthalmology. It's not a very well-known field or wasn't um, when, when I was going through. It was one or more of those black holes, uh, ophthalmology, ENT and that. And so um, balance is so important. And I'm going to stress that right from day one, that Although as important as medicine is, it's important to be healthy within medicine too, for your patient's sakes, because you're gonna burn out if you're not. And it's so easy to burn out, no matter what specialty you go into, even family medicine or internal medicine or any surgical specialty, you're gonna burn out if there isn't balance in your life. Your focus cannot just be medicine. There's a few of us where it is that focus because that's what we truly love and breathe and live, but. I still think that there's so much more to everybody than just that. So balance became my priority. I had my first child in my residency. Um, I only took 10 weeks off. I didn't take a maternity leave at the time. We weren't really allowed. It was even for food. I remember from one of my medical school interviews, specifically, I won't say what university, I didn't end up going there, but they asked me if I planned to get pregnant during my residency. I mean, you would never ask that nowadays. Um, so I did, and I had Christian, my firstborn, who's now almost 24, um, during my residency, went back and finished my residency and, and realized how important it was to spend time with my child, how happy he made me. Um, and then I had my second son two years out. So Robbie is now 21. And, um, and he, as well, I only took 10 weeks off, which was really tough. And I learned from that, that <clears throat> really there's so much more to life than just building my career. It's harder at the beginning. I think at the beginning, you do need to focus and build your career. But balance is good. Many of my residents ask me this question. I say to them, go and play a sport after work or focus on your family if that's what gives you pleasure. Or, you know, um, I tell all my residents that children, get involved in your children's lives. My kids have, have had an affluent lifestyle. But the things they remember are not the things that they received from me. The things they remember are the time that they spent with me. And so I always made the time to coach them. I am a certified Canadian basketball coach and all three of my boys. I also have a 13 year old boy now um, who I coached and we won the championships in grade six before COVID, COVID occurred. But uh, um, and that for me, I was a basketball player, um, mind you, not one of the best because of my height, but, but a basketball player nonetheless, I've always loved it. And, uh, and so I became a certified coach and I coached my boys at school. Um, I coached them until grade nine. 
Um, and then I let other coaches take over for their development. But that gave me all those years from grade four to grade eight with them, where I'd be at every practice, every game. Even when I traveled for ophthalmology, I came back and made sure I was back early to be there for a game. I finished my office early to be at a game at another school if I needed to be there. And, you know, I never regretted that ever of doing that. And you know what, my practice has flourished. Like we all think, oh, if I go into hiatus or if I do this, if I do that, I won't, won't get there. Um, I'll never make a name for myself. You can do whatever you want and have balance. Part of balance is finding what your interests are, what gives you peace of mind. For me, weightlifting gives me peace of mind. Running gives me peace of mind um, and karate used to give me peace of mind and it still would, but I'm more focused on weightlifting right now um, and bodybuilding. And part of that is nutrition. And the nutrition is also very important because we get busy, we tend to eat crap, like let's be honest. And so you need to make sure you have a good nutritional balance um, so that you will have more energy, you will be more alert in the OR or more alert in the clinic. You will not be hangry with your patients. You will um, be a lot more balanced with your colleagues um, and you'll feel better about yourself truly and honestly. And so nutrition is key, having a balanced macro diet, finding your Zen, which could be yoga, it could be running, it could be cycling, it could be bodybuilding, it could be whatever you want. It can be doing art and painting. I know a lot of women in medicine, I'm part of a Facebook group, women in medicine painting. Um, and so there are many that can express their feelings in art that they can't otherwise. And I think balance would be my key. You guys need to start in medical school, finding your balance keep that through your residency. Don't sacrifice your residency for it, but don't sacrifice your life for your residency either. Um, and then keep it through your careers and decide what you want to do. Not everyone needs to be academic. Not everyone needs to be on the podium. But I think that my um, advice to you is that when you're at the office or in the OR or teaching, you're at the office or in the OR or teaching. And when you're at home, you're with your family. And when you're at the gym, you're in the gym. Do you know what I mean? Uh, or running or whatever that makes you happy. And so you need to parcel your life that way because although we all love to think we can multitask, our brain really needs to focus on one thing or another. And that gives us more peace and allows us to be best at each of those tasks in that moment in time. And, you know, with kids, I used to feel guilty if I went to the gym or if I did an hour of karate or that, but that hour of karate or that hour at the gym or, or whatever made me a better mom when I came home because I wasn't resentful anymore. And I think guilt is definitely stronger in women than men, specifically when it comes to child rearing. Um, and so we need to put that aside and allow ourselves to, um, be better people by doing what we need to do to relax. Thank you so much for sharing all that incredibly valuable information. As a side note, Iman and I were on the middle school basketball team at our, our middle school, <laughs> and then everyone grew except for us. So we yeah. had, didn't have the same luck as you. We were the two shortest for a long time. <laughs> exactly. But no, I think you brought out a point that I think is extremely important in medicine and for all our listeners and all students. It's that sometimes the first thing that we tend to sacrifice is our mental health and these like outlets and our free time and the time that we put in somewhere else. And then we spend that time being a lot less mindful about actually doing what we're doing. When in, in reality, just taking that one or two hours um, to like do something that we love, like find that outlet, find that Zen is extremely important. And yeah. so thank you for, for sharing that. It's extremely important for everyone especially to develop those skills like in medical school so that you can carry them throughout your life so thank you Absolutely. and then just channeling a little bit about what you talked about in terms of being a woman in medicine I have like a quick follow-up question in terms of that so I know you talked about like challenges especially when you were going through medical school could you talk a little bit more about maybe what it's like to be a woman in medicine now if you have any advice for any of our um listeners any like challenges you've had or maybe even like opportunities that it's brought you so I think being a woman in medicine now is still 
um, you still have to break the glass ceiling, but it's, it's a lot easier than it was when I was going through. And for me, it was easier than my peers that were 10 or 20 years older than me. Um, I try to support every female resident that comes through. Um, unfortunately, sometimes women don't support women and I find that the hardest pill to swallow. So to other female residents, support each other. Don't be catty. Um, support and be friendly with your male colleagues because they will be part of your life. Um, I've had many male mentors. I've had very many female mentors. And I think it's important to do your best, um, have a voice, and be honest. So the one thing I think I'm well known for is shooting straight from the hip. Um, and so I tell it like it is. And people are very used to that. So no one sees that as a fault. Although in a woman... At the time, that could have been seen as a fault because the more you speak out, there are certain names that you would be called um, that you wouldn't necessarily be called as a male. A male would be seen as driven and a go-getter and a woman would be seen as, oh my God, she's such a, and you can fill in the blank, right? And so that's okay. You know what? If that's what someone needs to say, then say it and get on with it because I am not going to sit quietly and let you step on me as a person. Now, I'm not going to be rude and I'm not going to be aggressive. I don't think that's necessary, but I think it's important to have a voice. I think it's important to communicate effectively with people and rather than worry and, and obsess about it and you know, we need to be ourselves. And because we're women, we should not be penalized. So if you have something that you want, go and get it. Because you're a, wom a woman doesn't make it any less that you should be qualified for it. And, and I think nowadays, if I'm going to say honestly, I think men and women are a lot more on the same page. Some of my closest friends are residents that I trained and many of them are men and they have families and they wanna be there with their families. Now it's easier because a lot of them have non-medical wives at home that can stay home with the kids. But my piece of advice to all of those men are be home with your kids because your kids will not remember you or care that you're at work or a great doctor, but they're going to care if you're a great mom or a great dad. They're going to care if you spend time with them. And that's what's really important. And if you choose not to have kids, that's okay too. But at least have something that you care about in life and do that outside of medicine. But within medicine, find a good strong female mentor or find a good supportive male mentor that supports you as a female and as a person. Um, and choose and desire what you want to do. And it's okay to just wanna be in the office. It's okay to wanna be powerful and, and, and be at the top of your field and strive for whatever you want to do. And you can start striving in medical school. Um, you can start in your residency and you can look, I finished my residency and I'll tell you a little antidote. There was another female resident at the time who was a very strong personality, a wonderful person, and um, very, very bright. And I was more laid back. I was that little bit of a rebellion that just I wouldn't really conform. I kind of just didn't. I wanted to do what I needed to do and follow my path. And I didn't win any of the awards in medical spin residency. I did okay. I passed everything, but I kind of just told the line. And I was a great surgeon and a great clinician. That's where I prided myself on. But I wasn't going to, you know, be a 95 exam passer. I'd done all that in med school. I was done with all of that. I just needed to know what I needed to know. So I was told, you know, Rose, you're going to be a great community ophthalmologist and this other person is going to be a great academic. And that's just the way it's going to be. And so I went out into my practice and I started focusing on my practice. But you know what? I had an, equi an inquisitive mind. So all these new things started in ophthalmology. FACO started uh, becoming more prominent, IOL sizes, minimizing incision sizes. And I just started inquiring about it, started doing research. And I was at, on staff at a teaching hospital and started working with residents. And look at that, I was the youngest full professor at U of T uh, 
woman and man. I became a full professor at 38 because of all the research I had done um, as a part-timer, not even a geographic full-timer. So you can't tell what anybody's going to be. It has to be your drive and what you want to do. And I never did research for the sake of doing research and putting it on paper. I did research because I needed to know if A was better than B so that my patients would get the better outcome. And I think that to me is more important than the number of abstracts or papers you have and what you do. And, and we should all support each other, woman or man. I think that needs to end. The gender gap needs to end. And the only way we can end it is just as women also just moving forward and demanding that we are just treated as equals. End of story. Well, as a woman in, in medicine or in, in medical school, I'd like to say thank you for being such a strong advocate and inspiration to women, not only in ophthalmology, but women across all specialties. I think it's so important to have physicians like yourself that speak up for what they believe in and speak up for what's important. Um, because if we don't, then there's going to be no changes made. And it's because of physicians like you that, you know, we are seeing um, some changes. There's definitely a lot more to be done, but um, thank you so much for, for being that voice that we really need in um, across all specialties and across all fields, not only within medicine, but uh, but yeah, no, thank you so much, Danielle. And I definitely look up to you as a, as a mentor. And um, I'm sure lots of our listeners will, will feel the same way. Um, and, you know, you kind of uh, talked about how you mentor your residents and how you're an advocate for them as well. Um, and we know that you've won so many teaching awards throughout your career. But do you have any advice for students on how to be a great learners and how to stand out you know, when they're going through medical school and, and residency as well? So I think if you have an interest in an area, you should read up and be pretty well versed in that area. I don't expect you to be an ophthalmologist. I used to have medical students in my office and in my OR all the time. Um, many of the residents that came through my program were medical students with me at, 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 in previous years. Um, what I expect from my students and my residents specifically is that you know what I like. You, if we talk about a subject the next day, you come back understanding that subject even better and informing me more on that subject. Um, so read up on information. For my residents, I always say, you don't have to be a good surgeon when you come to me, but you have to be a good listener mm -hmm. and you have to take feedback well. So if you can listen, and mold and change by listening to advice and following direction, then you will do extremely well because that's all we expect. I know I have to teach you. Mm -hmm. I know that I have to show you how to be a good surgeon and then take you from good to great if you have that capability. But if you can't listen to me, I can do nothing. Mm -hmm. I can't I tell the residents, if you can't listen, you might as well leave because there's nothing I can do for you if you think you're already amazing and, mm -hmm. and you know everything and have a nice day and, and leave my OR. So my residents learn very quickly that if they listen and they model, um, they become better surgeons over time and they get more surgeries from me. Um, and even in the clinic, they become better clinicians if they listen to the feedback and they go and learn. So as a learner, I think that's the key. You, you, as I say, you have one mouth and two ears for a reason. Mm -hmm. So you should listen more than you speak as a learner. Um, and, and that's what's important um, as a learner is to listen and, and follow that feedback. Because if I see that, then, then I'm going to want to teach you more. And I love to teach. But if I feel like I'm hitting a wall, I have asked one or two residents to just leave my OR and never come back. And that is the one thing that will make me do that. If you have a complication, it's okay. Like, not that I love it, but it happens. Like, you're not a surgeon if you don't have complications, okay? Learn from them. Come back with a plan. Let's analyze what went wrong. But if the next time you make the same exact mistake, then we have a problem, right? You haven't learned. And I think that's what's important as a learner. And, and B, you know, people call it scout work. And what I call it is putting in your time. Mm -hmm. um, we all put in our time and believe me, I have a 24 year old son that says, well, you know, we can't all follow what everyone did in the past, mom. But the fact is 
sometimes that's the only way you learn. And those are the keys to learning and putting in your time because we all put in our time to become better people. And we all learn how to deal with other people. We all learn what we wouldn't, you know, I never would want to dump on a resident. I didn't like it when I was dumped on. So I would never do that. But if I'm giving you half of my surgical list, I expect you to follow up and see how your patients are doing. I mean, it's the least I can ask of you. Or if there's one patient that was done at the hospital and I can't make it to the hospital to see them, but meanwhile, I'm seeing all of your other post-ops in my office, you know what? It's not too much to ask that you go to the hospital and see that patient for me. That's not scut work. That's putting in your time and following your patients, right? And so I think that the best residents and the best students I've seen are the ones that put in the time that are eager, that want to learn, that listen well. And I think that's really important to, and humility is really important as well, because many of you guys, even in med school, have way more degrees than I ever did going through. I know there are some PhD students in med school. We've had some renowned residents that have come through that have their PhDs been on the podium speaking about retina neurological stuff. Brilliant, brilliant people, but they're humble when they're with us in the OR. That makes them better surgeons, better people, better clinicians. And, and it's wonderful. Then you develop a relationship, right? But you need to learn humility, developing relationships. And the key word is listening. I think that is the absolute key. I still listen. I'm still learning. I go to meetings and I learn from my colleagues all the time. And I'm old and I'm at the end of my career and I'm still learning. So you guys at the beginning of your career cannot tell me you know everything already. It's just not possible. 100%. And I think you like touch on something so important that first of all, we're going to be learning throughout our entire careers and our entire lives. But like there's this common misconception that, oh, you should be expected to know everything when you like enter a room, when you go in somewhere and like that should not be the case because you should be going in with this open mind and this willingness to learn and that honestly takes every student so much further. So thank you so much for sharing that. And thank you for answering all of these questions about the field of medicine and ophthalmology. Um, now we're going to change gears. As our listeners know, we always end off with some, we're going to do two would you rather questions, which um, our guests don't know before. So we get to kind of give them a little yeah. bit of fun on the spot. So I think Iman's going to start off with our first one. Yeah. So for our first one, would you rather only be able to work in high heels or only be able to work in flip-flops for the rest of your life? Oh, flip-flops. No question in my mind. I feel like that was a super easy question to be honest. <laughs> I don't even think about that one. Yeah. Never think about it. Constantly operating in, in heels. Yeah. Um, oh gosh. No. Well, I take my shoes off to operate anyway, but yeah. but um yeah, like high heel. That's the other thing, you know, why do women have to wear high heels and makeup and men don't? OK, and that's not only a pet peeve in medicine. It's in the bodybuilding world as well. When I get on stage, I've got to be all done up. But the men just, you know, have their short haircuts and whatever. Um, so, yeah, I think we need to change that. I, I, in fact, sometimes get very peeved when I see younger women in ophthalmology at the podium, which are great. I've mentored a lot of them up there. They're all in five inch heels and dresses. And I'm like the one who shows up in a suit and cowboy boots because that's comfortable. Mm -hmm. um, and I need to be comfortable. And then I'm like, well, maybe I should wear high heels. And then I wear them one night and I'm like, forget it. I'm never doing this again. Yeah. I love them. They're all in my closet. They look really pretty, but they're just, they're like torture devices, I think. But anyway, um, yeah, flip flops. No, at 100%. the end of the day, comfort is for sure key. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. <laughs> Okay, this question may be a little bit more tricky. We'll see. Um, okay. So, and it's a little bit more confusing. So, bear with me. But would you rather go back to kindergarten right now with everything you know, or would you rather have all the knowledge you'll ever have right now? Oh wow, that is a tough question. I don't know about kindergarten. Maybe back to my twenties with what I know <laughs> now. Um, no, I wouldn't change a thing. I really wouldn't. I would like to be where I'm at now. Um, that being said, just a couple of investment things I would have probably invested <laughs> in very differently with that knowledge and maybe not had to work so hard. But no, my life has been great. I have no regrets. And I think I know a lot, but I still have a lot to learn. And I think that's the key. I never want to stop being a learner. Mm -hmm. I've 
often said if I had all the money in the world, I'd go back to school mm -hmm. and just learn different things. I love it. Um, unfortunately, I have to work and support three kids through university and, and school. But, um, but yeah, no, I love where my life is at. And I know a lot, but there's still a lot to learn. And that's the fun part, learning. Because if you know everything, it's kind of boring. For sure. I think, yeah, I mean, you've talked about it a lot, but, uh, and so has uh, Danielle, but medicine is constantly just, it's a lifelong learning experience. So it's amazing to see that even at this stage in your career, you still love learning, um, especially for Danielle and I just starting out. It's, uh, it's very inspirational to see for sure. Um, and so, you know, with all of that being said, thank you so, so much for uh, being a part of this episode. We've loved having you on and I hope our listeners uh, feel the same way. So just to conclude, I'd like to thank everyone for listening to this episode of Seeing Clearly, which is a pre-clerkship guide to all things ophthalmology. And to stay caught up with everything else that iCurriculum is doing, be sure to check out our website at www.icurriculum.com and to follow us on Instagram at iCurriculum. Thank you again for, uh, for being a part of the episode. We really appreciate it. Good luck. Take care. Thank you. Okay. Bye.